Okay, folks, welcome to part two of protein synthesis. If you did not uh, already watch the first part of the video, this will maybe not make as much sense. You probably want to go back and watch the transcription PowerPoint first. So, uh, so far in our journey, uh, we've made an mRNA copy of the desired gene that we wish to use as a template. And the mRNA has been um, spliced and capped and tailed and it after that has happened it's what we call mature and it has migrated uh, from the nucleus into the cytoplasm and we are about to see how we can use that pattern to build a protein so that process is called translation All right, so the important um, enzymes and bits and pieces that we um, need for this process we're going to talk about. We're going to start by looking at the various kinds of RNA that are going to be required uh, to function. And the first one, of course, we're already familiar with. We've just produced our mRNA in the nucleus in the process of transcription. Uh, we understand that it is a pattern, a blueprint, as they say here, for the protein that we're going to make. And in terms of its structure, it is a single stranded linear, uh, more or less linear RNA. There are two other kinds of RNA, uh, both which are actually produced in the nucleus. Um, that are going to take on other roles in the process. The second one down in this table is transfer RNA. And transfer RNA is going to move around the nucleus and pick up amino acids. And that combination of the tRNA and the amino acid is specific. So there are many different kinds of tRNAs to correspond with the many different kinds of amino acids. So the, a particular transfer RNA will pick up a particular amino acid and will bring it to the ribosome where the mRNA is being used as a message. The transfer RNA is a sort of a weird clover shape. Um, looks like a little sort of hovering balloon robot-y thing. Um, and it's got one particular part of the structure which is going to match up uh, in the right location on the mRNA and that site we call an anticodon. Um, and I think the name for that will become clear as we go through the process. The last one on the table here is ribosomal RNA and the ribosome, uh, you'll remember from unit one, is one of the few organelles that we find in a cell that are that is not membrane bound. In fact, it is made from uh, ribosomal RNA and proteins. So there are two subunits to a ribosome, kind of like a large hamburger bun and a small hamburger bun, if you want a visual for that. And the two subunits are going to wrap themselves around the mRNA and facilitate the pair bonding, the um, hydrogen bonding with the transfer RNA and the building of the uh, protein polymer. So it's a very important uh, structure and again it's made of proteins and um, RNA. Okay, here's a nice little comparison of mRNA versus tRNA, and I'll just draw your attention to the visual here. Please note the mRNA picture is showing a DNA molecule with an mRNA being constructed from it. That's on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, we have a clover shape that is unique to the tRNA molecule, and if you look at the bottom of the molecule as it is aligned here, you will see that it's showing an anticodon in a red circle, and then you can see that it's pair, pair bonding with the mRNA strip that's being illustrated there at the bottom. So with the anticodon is matching up with the codon. Uh, if you have a few minutes, which I know you do, uh, please read through and um, just kind of take note of the differences between the two structures. All right, we've already talked about an mRNA table in your textbook. 
Um, and just a reminder that a few of the textbooks still haven't been corrected uh, on their mRNA table and uh, just be careful and make sure you've got the right uh, correct version of an mRNA table. This particular table um, is really uh, nice, visually nice to look at. Uh, unfortunately, the one letter code, so for instance, if you look at phenylalanine on the top left, they've got F as the, um, the short form code. We would use PHE for that. Um, and the, the red code letters seem to be kind of all over the place and I can't fix that on my graphics. So apologies for that. Um, but in terms of being visually um, obvious, it's a really nice setup because we can see the first letters are all in red, the second letters are all in blue, and the third letters are all in green. And again, we know there are three because we're reading these as a, as a, a codon from our DNA, right? We're reading them three letters at a time. Um, and each of those three letters is going to code for a particular amino acid, and that's the phenylalanine, the leucine, serine, proline. Those are the amino acids that they're going to code for. Also here we see the start codon. If you look in the left-hand column, third box down, you see AUG, and that codes for methionine if it's not the beginning of a um, of a uh, an mRNA um, of a gene, or basically, or the, the copy of the gene. Um, if it's right at the beginning, it acts as a start codon. And you also will see there's three stop codons. They're all in the top right-hand side, UAA, UAG, and UGA. And we did talk a little bit about those in class already. Those do not code for amino acids. They simply uh, have the function of stopping um, the translation. All right, we can divide the steps of translation up the same way we did with transcription, with initiation, elongation, and termination. So initiation, the small subunit of the ribosome, and I like this um, diagram that's up here. We can see one subunit in step one at the top uh, binds to the five prime end of the messenger RNA, and we can clearly see the sort of orangey yellow mRNA and the five prime end is um, is sort of surrounded by the small subunit of the ribosome. The small subunit will sort of read down from the five prime end until it encounters the start codon AUG. So the first time it reads AUG, that's where things start to happen. Um, that region between the point where the ribosome binds to the five prime end, the five prime cap, um, and the point where it actually finds the first AUG is known as the five prime untranslated region. So it doesn't code for anything. It gives the ribosome a chance to get a grip and find where it needs to begin. After the initiator um, codon is, or sorry, the uh, start codon is found, then an initiator tRNA is added into that point and we can see the initiator tRNA in yellow up top UAC and we can see in step two that it is binding to the AUG codon. The initiator tRNA bonds to what we call the P site on the ribosome. There are two sites on the ribosome that we're going to be looking at. And it's a little hard to see maybe on this diagram, but you've got a P and an A site. So the P site is more to the left there, and that's where the initiator codon bond, uh, the initiator ant um, anticodon tRNA um, match up with the codon on the mRNA. Usually when we're adding uh, tRNAs into this, it's going to be added into the A site. And as I mentioned before, that initiator tRNA carries methionine. All right, here's that diagram blown up a little bit, which is nice, it's a little easier to see here. <coughs> so again, step one for initiation, the UAC, um, or the, sorry, uh, small subunit is going to bind to the five prime end of the mRNA. It's going to read down until it finds AUG, which is what we see in the diagram in step one. The initiator uh, tRNA is going to bond, pair bonds. We can see here in step two, A bonds with U, U bonds with A, G bonds with C, and 
um, that's going to happen in the P side, the left hand side that's here. And then the large subunit is going to join uh, to the bottom and now our complex is complete and we're ready to begin elongation. All right. Um, so if you'll remember, this is kind of upside down compared to the other diagram that we saw. We've got our mRNA at the bottom here, and we've got our initiator tRNA in blue up top. We can see the anticodon UAC. We can see the start codon AUG, just like we did before. And this is the P site that we are uh, looking at here. All right, so the next part of the codon, the next codon, I don't know how easy it is to see here, but is ACC. That is the next codon on the mRNA. So our next tRNA that comes in has UGG as its anticodon. And up on the other end, uh, you can see we've got methionine in blue and then we've got threonine in pink. So this top square is actually another amino acid. Okay, and look how nice and cozy they are sitting there together. Hopefully you can sort of see that this would facilitate um, a peptide linkage between these two amino acids. Um, so as mentioned here, the methionine in this case is going to be covalently linked to the incoming amino acid with a peptide bond. So a nice peptide bond is going to form between these two things that are so nice and cozy inside the ribosome. All right, now this is going to show it has a cycle, which is really what's going to happen. So uh, let's orient ourselves a little bit here. Um, if you uh, if you have a look at this, our in brown obviously is our ribosome, and in orange is our mRNA. Um, if you look at the top diagram we can see that, and don't worry about the E that's there, we're just worried about P and A. At the very top of the diagram at 12 o'clock, you can see that there is a tRNA that's in the P site. Um, and we can see that there's a new tRNA that's entering the A site in pair bonding. And on the end of the tRNA is a square or diamond that's representing another amino acid. So let's go down to three o'clock. <clears throat> Here we can see that the tRNA has indeed pair bonded and we can see that a covalent bond is occurring between the um, amino acid that was attached to the tRNA in the P site uh, to the amino acid that's attached to the tRNA in the A site. Then what's going to happen is the bond between the tRNA and its amino acid in the P site is released and now we can see that the uh, tRNA that's in the A site is holding the whole string of amino acids. Um, that's down at 6 o'clock. And if we go up to 12 o'clock, we can see that that tRNA is released. Um, and the ribosome, almost like a Pac-Man, if you like, has moved down a location or the mRNA strip has moved up a location, if you will. And the tRNA that was in A location is now in P location, ready to receive a new tRNA with a new amino acid, <coughs> dictated again by the pair bonding um, of A's and T's and, um, or A's and U's and C's and G's and so on. So this is going to repeat over and over until we get to a stop codon. So just a, a little note, I sort of emphasized it when we were going through it. The initiator tRNA is the only tRNA that is going to be able to go directly into the P site. All other tRNAs have to enter in the A site and then <coughs> kind of get moved along to the P site after. Um, so that is kind of a, you know, a, a distinct um, function of the initiation that does not happen again. Okay, so the P site is named uh, P site because it only takes that special um, 
uh, initiator tRNA, and then a tRNA is able to move into that site if it's attached to the growing peptide chain, which the, if you think about it, right, the um, the new incoming tRNAs only have one amino acid attached to them. They don't have the polypeptide chain. So the tRNA that has a polypeptide chain is able to occupy the P location. The A site um, is bringing in the tRNA that has the next amino acid. So maybe you could think of it as A for amino acid site, so in bringing in a new amino acid, and P for the growing peptide site. Um, and that's basically the way it's going to work all the way through elongation. All right, termination is our final step in terms of the uh, ribosomal involvement. And at the end of translation, the ribosome hits one of the three stop codons. Um, after that, there's of course, from the stop codon to the end, there's all those poly A regions and they are untranslated. So they don't get made into protein. Um, and again, that from that point, the stop codon to the end of the mRNA, mRNA strip, we call it the three prime untranslated region of the mRNA. Okay, so <coughs> as we mentioned when we were looking at the table, the tRNA molecules that correspond, or sorry, the mRNA molecules for the stop have no corresponding amino acid. Instead, um, there is a protein releasing factor or a set of factors that recognize when um, one of these stop codons has arrived in the A site. And um, so here we're seeing it in, again, we're seeing it sort of moving the other way this time. Oh, no, we're not. We're seeing it uh, very similar to the diagram we just saw. And the releasing factor uh, enters um, to bind with one of the stop codons. And that basically releases not only the last tRNA molecule, but also the polypeptide chain. And all of the pieces are able to um, to separate and go on to uh, to translate another mRNA strand. All right. In a lot of critters, we need to make a lot of protein at one time, i.e. maybe we have eaten um, some toast for breakfast and we need some carbohydrates to be able to digest that. Uh, what I'm showing or trying to show you here in this picture is what we call a polysome. Just have a look at the diagram for a minute. The purple pieces are the two subunits of the ribosome, and you can see they're starting at the five prime end. The little green strip that's coming off there is the protein that's being built. And so we're seeing um, what maybe looks like a series of pictures, right? Like the start up at the top and then gradually what's happening. In fact, on this one mRNA strip that we're seeing here in pink, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six um, separate ribosomes that are reading the same strand at the same time. So once one ribosome attaches at the at the start end of the mRNA strip and reads from five prime to three prime, um, as soon as it moves along enough, another ribosome can attach and read the very same piece and make the same protein. So it's like an assembly line. Uh, we're using that one pattern to make many, many uh, proteins. This complex of ribosomes altogether is called a polysome, so many ribosomes. And this is an electron micrograph of uh, what that might look like. We've got sort of the start end of the uh, mRNA strip um, in the uh, where the arrow is pointing, and we've got ribosomes reading along, and we can see the growing polypeptide chain. Very cool picture. Okay, there is a video here, which obviously you won't be able to watch um, directly from this video. You can go to the PowerPoint on the St. Mary website and link there if you want, or you can take note of this URL and uh, put it in your browser. Okay, also something to mention um, as we're getting to the end of this is that just like there was post-transcriptional modification, there can be loads of post-translational modification. We've already seen that proteins have many, many functions, that shape is very important, and lots of these molecules will be achieving tertiary or quaternary level. 
Um, and also we can have variations, i.e. you can, uh, one of the common ones would be to have a combination of protein and carb that would do a particular uh, work for the cell or, or do a particular job. So we've got lots of post-translational modification of those polypeptides, just like we had uh, modifications after we produce the original mRNA strip in the strip in the nucleus. So there's still work to be done. We're just kind of leaving it here because there's lots of different things that can happen.